If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. We'll begin reading in verse 22 and read through verse 34. Acts 17, 22 through 34. Hear God's word. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I pass along and observe the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, We ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And Father, now once again this evening we come around your word. We come to your word specifically looking in it for what it teaches us particularly about you. As we learned last week, Father, your scripture principally teaches what we are to believe concerning you and what duty you require of us. Tonight we come together and and we look at this reality that you are a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in your being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Father, guide, direct, and teach us in these things from your word. That we, your people, might be edified. That your name might be glorified. That all this would be done because of Christ crucified on our behalf. And it's in his his name that we pray. Amen. We've looked over the past few weeks at the question of what man's chief end is. It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We've discussed the the rule that God has given to direct us, how we may glorify him and enjoy him forever. The, The word of God containing the scriptures of the Old and New Testament being the only rule to direct us, how we may glorify and enjoy him. And we asked the question, what do the scriptures principally teach? And saw that the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. But if these scriptures are to instruct us about God, it is going to be incumbent upon us that we understand what or who God is. Now, it's somewhat of a joke, but also to be taken somewhat seriously. Uh, My pastor pointed out to me some years ago that there's a portion of the Institutes of Calvin's Christian religion um, where uh, Calvin says of this question, what is God, and I'm paraphrasing here, that, that those who ask such a question are stupid idiots and trifling with God's word. For God is not a what, but he is a who. And Calvin goes on this big, grand excursion about why we shouldn't ask what God is. I'm certain that the divines were fully aware of Calvin's thoughts on the matter and probably took them into consideration when they wrote the catechism. But nevertheless, they went against the Calvin grain and asked the question this way, what is God? And while in one sense we want to certainly acknowledge that God indeed is a person, uh, that he is a one person uh, existing in three persons, which we'll learn much more about in the coming weeks, God nevertheless is indeed also a what? And the reason that we can say that is because of much of what we'll see tonight, that God is so much other than ourselves. Then in some sense, we we may think that to ask the question, what is God, is to remove the, the personality of God, to remove those realities that Scripture puts out so beautifully and so plainly for us of God's personableness in relation to us. 
But at the same time, when we ask who is God, we likewise run the risk of trying to bring God too far down to our level, farther than he himself is willing to go. So we rightly ask the question, what is God? And our catechism rightly gives the answer. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. So what does it mean when the catechism says that God is a spirit? The claim that God is a spirit is an indication that he does not have a body like men. The children's catechism puts it this way. Um, What is God? God is a spirit and does not have a body like men. And this further illustrates the point, which we've seen over and over in both our morning and evening sermons today, that God is completely other than the creation. This morning we looked at Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, chapter 7, paragraph 1, which says that the distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part. When we speak of the being of God, we are speaking of a great chasm between us as the creation and him as the creator. God shows himself to be a spirit when he speaks through Moses to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 19. He says, therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air. The likeness of anything that creeps on the ground. The likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. God is here warning the Israelites of the dangers of crafting for themselves carved images which might serve their purposes for worship. And he warns them here not only of the danger of taking an active participation in carving images, but even of finding worshipful attitude in other things within the creation, the animals, the birds, or or the stars in the sky, or the sun, or the moon, or the clouds, or anything that they see whenever they look around them. And what would possibly be the purpose for such a warning if it were not for the fact that none of these physical forms could possibly ever fully communicate the magnitude of the glory of God himself. This reality should immediately impact our worship. First, in the negative, as we're seeing, that it is not appropriate or proper for us to worship God using statues or images. We'll talk a lot more about that when we get to the second commandment. But for right now, this mere explanation of the being of God puts us in that very direction. That proper worship of God is not to be had in the form of images and idols and carved, created things. Now, this reality should impact our worship not only negatively, but also positively. Jesus points out in John 4, 24 that God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Paul made this very point in the text that we read to introduce this evening's sermon. If God is a spirit, then our worship of him must not exist in merely temporal, carnal things. Of course, this does not mean that we do not worship God with the physical elements with which he has left us. It would be ludicrous to imply that we should not worship him with our mouths, our hands, our feet, our tongues, our eyes. Or that we cannot worship him in this building using paper... Instruments, bread, wine. The teaching is not that physical things are not used, but rather that the use of them is to flow from a heart changed by the truth of this God who is spirit. God is a spirit, therefore our worship of him should be in spirit. It should be spiritual. Now the question is begged at this point, well what in the world does that mean? 
I mean, there's lots of talk today about spirituality and what it means to be spiritual. So, so if we're saying that we are to worship God in a spiritual sense, does this mean that we, that we come in with incense, maybe haven't smoked a little something before we came, get our senses tingling, get our bodies moving and, and be affecting the emotions that we might be led into some kind of trance-like uh, wild dance party that is, can be defined as spiritual worship? Of course not. We worship God in spirit when we worship him according to his word. It is the spirit which inspired the word and it is the spirit bearing witness with our spirit which evidences to us that the word is God's word. Let me read that again to make sure we all catch it. It is the spirit which inspired the word and it is the spirit bearing witness with our spirit which evidences to us that the word is God's word. And it is this same spirit which empowers and enables our worship. Some of you have made it known to me, whether it be for football or not feeling well or being tired, that it was kind of difficult to get here today. I understand. I didn't get my evening nap, so I totally get it. But nevertheless, as much physical gumption as you mustered up within yourself to come here tonight, there's a reality at which you were driven here, not merely by your emotional gumption that you worked up within yourself, But because the Spirit dwells in you, having professed your faith in Christ by the work of that Spirit, having repented of your sins, having been united to Christ by the Spirit, having been united in that same Spirit to a church, that Spirit worked in you to say, it's the Sabbath day. And on this Sabbath day, we worship God and we rest from our worldly labors. So I'm going to go. Whether you're aware of it or not, it is the Spirit that brought you here It is the same spirit which empowers and enables our worship. So our worship of God as spiritual does not nullify the practical. Rather, it establishes it. God has ordered in his word that the people of God would keep the Sabbath day holy, setting aside the Lord's day for worship and rest. God has ordered that this is to take place around the word and sacraments. God has further established in his word the institution of psalm and hymn singing. And last but certainly not least, God has ordered in his word that the people of God are to be a people of prayer. This is what it means to worship God in spirit. Worshiping him by the simple means of grace which he has provided for his people. So having established that, the answer to the catechism says that God is a spirit infinite. Now what does it mean that God is infinite? The infinity of God is otherwise known as his omnipresence. The term refers to the beginninglessness, yes, I made that word up, and endlessness of his being as it relates to space. It is elsewhere referred to as his vastness. The children's catechism asks, where is God? The answer is, God is everywhere. David declares in Psalm 139, 7 and 10, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Indeed, God cannot be contained to any space within any particular container, no matter how great or small. Now, the reality of the infinity of God, as it has been proven from Scripture, has at least three applications for us. First, for the non-believer, for the enemies of God, there is nowhere they can turn to escape His presence and His wrath on their deeds of unrighteousness. No particular level of rejection of the reality of God and no tricks or foolery that anyone might contrive on themselves, no staying as far away from shadowing the doors of a church or as far away from cracking open the pages of a Bible or as far away from turning on Christian radio or a Christian podcast or a Christian television station or whatever, no matter how far you keep yourself away from these things, there is no running from the presence of God Almighty. This should lead those who deny such a God to tremble. For the believer, all of your deeds are done in the open as far as God is concerned. So you have a a similar reality that you have to face here. But this should urge us towards holy living, which the reformers referred to as quorum Deo, before the face of God. Those of you that are faithful with your table talk will be familiar with that word. All of our lives are lived as quorum Deo before the face of God. Of God. 
So there's a very real sense for those of us who profess faith in Christ and claim to be believers and worshipers of this God that His presence is always with us and therefore should certainly inform how we live our lives. But there's a more positive spin on this as well. Thirdly, for the believer, you can always commune with God as you seek to worship Him in spirit both privately and corporately since He's always there. Now... The reality of your ability to worship God at any point, any place, at any time leads to some caution because I can hear the foolish thoughts turning even now. This by no means justifies the mentality that we can cast off the ceremony of the Lord's day and replace it with private worship. God has ordered both that His people would gather together on the Lord's day for worship and that their everyday lives would be lives lived in worship before Him. All of life is worship. You are always worshiping something. And for the believer, it is God who we are to be worshiping. And God in His providence has established at least one day in seven in which the people of God gather to do just that together as the body of Christ. God is the Spirit, infinite and eternal. What does it mean that God is eternal? The eternality of God refers to His beginninglessness. Is that made up a word again? And endlessness with regards to time. The psalmist declares, O my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days, you whose years endure throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain, and they will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end." God's eternality serves to further distinguish us from Him. Our entire lives, both immediately and immediately, are summed up in finitude. We know our date of birth. We know that one day we will die. We know the birth dates of many of our friends and loved ones. We know many of their dates of death, or at least that they too will one day die. We know when we begin new jobs... When we quit old ones. We know when we buy new cars and sell old ones. We know when our billing cycles for all of our bills begin and end. Or at least you should. Otherwise that could be really problematic for you. Our lives are defined by beginning, by beginnings and by ends. But not so with God. God is not bound by time. Nor does He exist in time. God is completely other than all of His creation. And that includes the creation of time. God is the Spirit, infinite and eternal. God is the Spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Now this attribute is otherwise called His immutability. God does not mutate. He does not change. This is evidenced in at least two passages where the truth of this doctrine is directly related to the covenant relationship God has with His people. In Psalm 33, it is said... The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of His heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen as His heritage. Do you see the relationship there between God and His enemies and God and His people and His immutability? Because His counsels stand forever, because His counsels stand from generations to generation, His counsels frustrate the plans of the nations, those who are not His people. It frustrates them. He's constantly intervening. There's nothing that they can do against Him and nothing that they can do against His people that He cannot defend against. Likewise, because His counsel stands forever, the plans of His heart to all generations... Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen for His heritage. The standing forever of God's counsel is a blessing to those who are His people. Now in another place where we just read earlier, Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore the children of Jacob are not consumed. In this passage, the weakness of God's people in keeping their end of the bargain is shown. Thanks be to God, the covenant of grace, established in Genesis 3.15, which we saw this morning, and fulfilled in Christ, does not depend on our obedience. 
but on the passive and active obedience of Christ as a substitute in our place. Therefore, God's immutability, His unchangeableness, serves to our joy as we are reminded of the severity of God who is on our side. It's one thing to realize that God is severe. To realize that God is severe and to be against you is daunting, to put it lightly. But to realize that God is severe and is on your side is a whole other conversation entirely. God does not change. And because God does not change, He is a sure foundation for our hope and for our trust. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Now, all of these three attributes, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, make up what we commonly refer to as the incommunicable attributes standing alone. When they're placed alongside each of the following seven, these incommunicable attributes are further illustrated. And the latter seven uh, refer to the communicable attributes of God. Let me define some terms for you uh, before we move into the final point here. The incommunicable attributes refer to those that can be communicated to or find analogy in the creature. Or do not, cannot be communicated to and cannot find analogy within the creature. We, uh, he is infinite, we are finite. He is eternal, we are temporal. God is unchangeable, we are fluid, constantly changing. Now, for the sake of time, we'll look at the incommunicable or the communicable attributes next week. But at this point, let us ask the question, what do these attributes, the incommunicable ones, mean in light of the gospel? God is a spirit, infinite, How do they point us to the gospel or how do they relate to this good news? God is so completely other than us, as we have said. God is infinite, we are finite. God is eternal, we are temporal. God is unchangeable, we are fluid. When these realities are considered in light of who Jesus was and is, the church is led to worship. God is a spirit. Christ took on flesh and became a man that he might suffer in our place Nevertheless, Christ was empowered by God the Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity. In Romans 8, 9, and 11, Paul puts it this way, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The spirituality of God, though also serving our worship as we saw earlier, likewise informs our faith. Our eternal hope of a regeneration now and a resurrection later. The spirituality of God gives the church hope in Christ. God is infinite. God, who cannot be contained, saw fit to contain himself in the likeness of human flesh. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. The vast, infinite God of the universe expressed his fullness in the form of of human flesh, come to die. That we might be reconciled to him and that there would be peace in all things through him. God is eternal. And the eternal God of the universe saw fit to come in human flesh that he might die. Let's turn to John chapter 19. John 19, verses 17 through 30. Let's read this keeping in mind the truth that we have heard. 
So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription, put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he lo- disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Christ would see the end of his earthly life, that he might declare to us, it is finished. The God, who was eternal, would come and taste the end that is death, that we might be reconciled to him. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and God is unchangeable. We read earlier how God's immutability is what keeps his people from being consumed in their disobedience. Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. And this immutable faithfulness is exactly what we are called into in the new covenant. And so we close with a reading from Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59 beginning in verse 14. Justice is turned back. And righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from transgression declares the Lord. And as for me... This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. It is the unchangeableness of God. When God, the unchangeable one, speaks the word that he speaks, the unchangeable word. Unless we don't grasp that with our carnal, finite minds, God goes so far as to condescend again and specifically spell it out. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord from this time forth. And forevermore, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Let the church worship him. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to come together.
come together again to worship you. Pray, Father, that this reading and this sermon has been a blessing to you, has been glorifying to you, and has been edifying for your people. Pray now that you would go with us out of this place as we carry this word with us, that we would constantly dwell, meditate on, and think on these realities of you as a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and as Christ, God in the flesh, who carried within himself all the weakness of human flesh, yet also of the Godhead, God and man, come to live the life that we could not live and die the death that we deserve, that we might be reconciled to you. Praise and thanks be to you for this, Father God. In Christ we pray. Amen.